Welcome to the video portion of Inquiry Project Management Tools for Tired Teachers. I'm Alana King. And I'm Tim King. My teaching context, um, I'm a computer technology teacher. I teach at the secondary level in Ontario Public School. And in that capacity, I teach everybody from grade nine to grade 12 open level classes. And we cover everything from information technology and networking to electronics. And most recently, we created a game development program that focuses on 3D modeling and animation. So what's this diagram up here in the corner? So the engineering design process is the central piece to what I'm doing. And what this does is it allows me to keep my sanity while I'm trying to chase four really distinct subjects uh, across my curriculum. Um, in, in my class, as possible, students can be doing robotics one week, and then the next week they're doing coding, and then the week after that they're doing electronics. Week after that they're building computers. Um, these things are all quite different, but what we settled on was if we follow the engineering design process, this is an iterative step-by-step -step process. Um, and it's basically the point of the engineering design process is to give you a solution. Um, this is directly cribbed from NASA. So if it can put people on the moon, it should be able to help students create projects. You know what's weird about your engineering design process is it, it looks really familiar to me. It, yeah, it should. Because it kind of looks like the inquiry model that the Canadian School Library Association uses. You know, when we're exploring a topic or we're developing a hypothesis, um, investigating, processing our research, and then finally creating something out of it, right? It reminds me a lot of my context when I started in the arts, um, did my first degree in drama, and ended up teaching drama, media, art, and English. But of course, my happy place was using all of these things at once in the school library. And even the inquiry process has always reminded me of the creative process. And this is from the Ontario Music Educators Association. It's one of my favorite versions of the of the graphic. But look how similar it is in terms of the challenging and the inspiration and imagining generating a prototype and then working through the actual experimentation and revision pr process through feedback, right? There's just so many things that are we have in common here. Yeah, before I became a Sith STEM teacher, uh, I worked in arts and as a visual arts teacher, the creative process, creative design process, is something that allowed me to jump into the engineering process really comfortably. I, they actually call it the engineering design process and design and creativity is integral to it. And, and it's because of these contexts that Tim and I share, but also the opportunity that, um, in a sense, the pandemic gave me that I started to approach design again from an instructional point of view. And I did my uh, my graduate certificate in instructional design through Royal Roads University. And it was the course in project management for instructional design that really got Tim and I talking about how these things might happen in the classroom. And we actually had the opportunity to work on something together. So let's just talk a little bit about where we found ourselves in that moment. Do you want to start with this? Yeah, so um, this would be sort of uh, winter and spring of 2020. It was a happy time. We were <laughs> traveling, seeing people from other countries. And uh, then suddenly uh, we had March break and everything changed. Um, we suddenly found ourselves in a bizarre situation where we were back to back um, in our in our home office. Um, but what was fascinating was I was in real time trying to figure out how to keep all of our heads above water in this rapidly changing situation. And then Alana was right behind me talking about project management and um, credible academic support that I could collect from her program at Royal Roads. But in essence, we moved from real time and face to face learning to real time in remote learning. That was one of your contexts in terms of teaching. Then we also moved from my asynchronous e-learning. I've been teaching asynchronous e-learning for since 2009, mostly grade 12 English students who wanna graduate to suddenly synchronous remote learning. And I had never done that before, been an online remote teacher, but with regularly scheduled classes every day. 
and we were using a dynamic virtual learning environment, Google Classroom and Google Meets. We were also using a static virtual learning environment in Brightspace. And so these four variables of dynamic, static, asynchronous, and synchronous led us to many, many challenges. And then, of course, we were also working back to back in our home for the first time and our only time actually since then. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I'm trying to figure out how to bring a classroom that I'd launched and had been running for half the course, really, before March break, mm -hmm. and trying to get that in alignment so we can land the thing. Um, it's a student-led process that we follow in the game design course, so students were really, really mm, invested in seeing it through. So I, I maybe had motivation that other teachers weren't enjoying as much. Absolutely. Um, but in your case, with the e-learning, um, it felt, I think, like trying to grab sand as it fell through your fingers. Yes, there were kids who were opting in and out and still were, at the same time, some of them were very motivated to finish at the yeah. top of their game. So all sorts of things. So that led us to explore project management. So we just talk a minute pause here because... Project management was something in its essence, conceptually, that was still unusual for me. It wasn't something that I had a vocabulary to talk about yet. And yet the specifics of applying knowledge, schools, skills, tools, and techniques to meet client requirements was something that I've done every day, but especially as a teacher librarian. And that also led us to this great conversation we had, right, about these these eight terms here, and there are more, but these eight terms we found ourselves using and then repeating it actually in our classroom. Stakeholders, clients, risk analysis, but then the specifics about how you negotiate scope, sequence, schedule, budget, and Scrum. And Scrum came from my side of things because we'd been exploring agile development and agile software development is kind of a uh, a flattening of the hierarchy. So the idea of a scrum and agile development is everybody has a lot of power in the room. Uh, you don't waste a lot of time in meetings. The meetings are never top down. They're highly interactive. Everybody's engaged. And and from that, you're you're supposed to get an empowered project solution. What I found in high school, though, was uh, that it tended to create a lot of chaos. And when I did some more research on it, I found most businesses have actually stepped back from it, too. Mm -hmm. But there are some really valuable pieces that we can take from it and move forward. And I think that's part of what we realized throughout the project is that the way that we had, you know, encountered the employment world outside of school, the way that um, our, our colleagues in other sectors and in other industries were encountering, encountering work in sort of this nature of, of contract and sort of precarity meant that project management was something that was a very, very real now literacy. I mean, we're calling it on this slide future ready, but this is like happening 10 years ago at least because people are hired on a contract basis now. So managing time and managing time zones, that's a really normal thing, I think, in the year 2022. Um, the same thing, and I think this is what you're talking about, right, Tim, is that the collaboration, the socialization pieces that we'd count on in our face-to-face -face classrooms, we were just underserving our students in those remote or online places. Collaboration in its very nature is really hard to keep track of, especially when it's by students. I would probably be harsher than that. I would say that we fall back on the crutch of the classroom and it hides all manner of bad habits. And one of the things project management does, what was interesting to me was Alana was talking about project management, academic research, because project management is a job, it's a career, it's an industry. Um, and her descriptions of it through the Royal Roads material was really powerful because I'd always thought that, well, we'll just follow engineering process and, you know, make it as credible as we can. And what I found was I'm going to start integrating key 
industry project management ideas into the classroom because it helped when we were remote. Um, it helped when we came back. It helped when we were remote again. It helped when we came back again. Uh, and all of those pivots and the chaos and, you know, the people are tired. But what this allows you to do is follow some really clearly and logically laid out structures that can help everybody. And Tim's ideas here, Tim's reactions are similar to what's happening right now in project manage management research. And the trends here on this slide are that communication is in such a way as, as what we're about to show you today with our Trello board is replacing formal meetings. They're not happening nearly as much anymore. And at the same time, there are many, many moving parts. And so we need and industry needs a personal accountability system that supports the greater project or the organization. And really interestingly, the hierarchy that we think associate with corporations is being flattened because this communication is leading to different types of leadership forms and different relationships between leadership and employees. Different organizational structures. Absolutely. But you already knew all of this. I mean, we're sure that the audience that we're speaking to, the people who are rocking Canadian school libraries, you know that the leading learning indicators, which are, I, you know, starting to feel like they're outdated, or are they, um, are here. Like, this is, one is all about instructional partnerships. And I can remember face-to-face -face that, yes, I would collaboratively plan instruction. But through all of the technological challenges we faced in the last couple of years, we're already at the far end of the scale here, fostering student and teacher technological capacities and digital literacies. That's why we knew that this tool about project management, these ideas would be relevant to your work. Similarly, a virtual library learning commons needs to empower learners to co-create and share ideas and knowledge with the broader learning community. In yesteryear, we used to do informational needs and supporting, but we are empowering and we are enabling co-creation on a daily basis now. So ICTC, I've been seconded to them now, so I'm, I'm working from home all over the country, which is very exciting. But their focus has been educational outreach. So a lot of organizations at the federal and provincial levels are working on online material you can use and things like that. But ICTC has gone a step further and they're really trying to create relationships and partnerships with educators in the classroom and with with librarians and libraries. And the idea here is um, this we're trying to serve an underserved digital skill set. Um, a lot of our graduates are wandering out into the world and and industry is frustrated by the lack of digital skills. Um, and it doesn't matter where you work, whether you work in a factory doing manufacturing, whether you work in a retail environment, um, it really doesn't matter. Uh, wherever you work, digital skills have become foundational and ICTC's focus has been on that. And you know what I really love about this is that even back all the way down to grade three and grade six, starting point here is managing relationships and deal with conflict online. That's not a grade three skill. That's an everybody skill. I know so many ways in which managing relationships and dealing with conflict online has hampered adult workers that I know, right? So I, I really like that these are everywhere communication and relationship things. And just because it's a digital skill doesn't mean that it's not focused on that relationship and communication piece. So how does this one differ? This is grade six to eight, right? And so we've got foundational skills again, but what we're talking about now is an awareness of the permanence and networked nature of digital technology. Have you seen that in your classroom in the last couple of years, Tim? Well, and the idea there is the continuity. I'm I'm able to see it in my program because if I have a student from grade nine to 12, the difference between them in grade nine to grade 12 is astonishing because we've built these digital skills in a foundational way all the way through, just like you would with literacy or numeracy or any other foundational skill. Um, but the problem is my course is optional and less than 10% of the school takes it. So a tiny proportion of our graduates, even with a very well-developed digital skills curriculum, are 
while being served. So imagine if there was a point person in every school building mm. that could take some of those ideas about digital literacy, communication, and relationships and di digital spaces and actually iterated the process of collaborative technology work. And this isn't a new thing for libraries. Way, way back when, I'm a very digitally literate person, but way, way back when, the very first computer I ever laid hands on was a Commodore PET in my middle school library. So to say this is something new for libraries just isn't the case. Libraries have always been at the leading edge of this, and librarians play a foundational role in it. And at the same time, we know that resources vary from each school library space to another. And so we're going to try to show you a few ways to tackle this project management idea. Similarly, though, Tim, you talked a little bit earlier about how project management actually is a career path. And I like the final part of ICTC's digital youth roadmap here. We go from grade eight all the way to post-secondary. So it's not just about navigating different audiences. It's about thinking about contributions on a global level. Yeah, and that really is the power of this. If, if you're able to fluently work in this medium, you're able to connect with people from everywhere. And the final thing that's here that I really wanted to ask you about is like over in the bottom right corner, it says create, you take active steps towards building a positive online identity. Did you see different um, sides of your students coming out in terms of their leadership or their personalities because they were collaborating in these digital spaces? I've had some interesting experiences with this when I was teaching English. Uh, one of the things I did was have my grade 11s create a real blog, like in the world, that people would read. And what suddenly happened there was the groups that generally wouldn't be writing, um, I'm thinking, for instance, the boys, were suddenly very serious about doing this properly. And suddenly it wasn't a matter of, yeah, I didn't bother to spell check. It is, I don't want to put something out that other people are going to read that makes me look stupid. So it, the motivation for tangible, genuine learning experiences is, is real. In the game dev class, the students create a Twitter account for their game, and then they post about how they're building their game online. And they make connections with real world game development studios. Um, they follow each other on Twitter and talk to each other. And for the students, this is just mind blowing. They're suddenly out of that bubble in, in the world. So there's an authenticity that's internal to the classroom because they have to work together in order to get done. But then that's amplified as soon as they take it public. Exactly. Amazing. Okay, so let's talk about Trello itself. It's a tool for, por for project management. Why do you think we should choose this resource? The first thing that I wanted to point out is that there's some research about how librarians themselves in other sectors other than education are using Trello for something like collection migration. Let's say you want to move your entire collection from one um, asset management system to another, then you are going to do that. But you have to probably do that asynchronously because there's never a time when library workers actually get to sit down and collaborate live together face to face, right? That's very rare. So there's some research supporting it that way. Why don't you talk about the agile software development piece? So for me, the agile software development, the idea there is uh, you scrum every week and uh, you set short term goals and then you land them. And uh, if you don't land them because it's game development, you sleep on the couch in your office and then you get up after three hours of sleep and you land them. Um, you don't go into a scrum and put pie in the sky things out there that aren't going to happen. Uh, your, your credibility is on the line. Um, one of the dangerous things, dangerous, I don't know, but one of the difficult things about working in that flattened hierarchy is everyone's suddenly the CEO. And you've got to take things as seriously as that. So agile development, really uh, complicated and empowering, maybe a bit too empowering. But what you really need is a structure to fall back on that people can see what's happening. So, so if we've got a targeted deadline, we are going to meet it come hell or high water. Yes. And you can't just pull something out of the air saying, I'm going to do whatever, and then suddenly not be able to land it because you weren't really thinking seriously about doing that. So the whole idea of sort of um, fake targets to look good or any of that political stuff in an agile environment, it, it turns into a piranha attack. Like it's just <laughs> horrifying. So then finally, we want to give you the third example, which is Tim's collaborative projects and remote secondary learning in terms of why you might want to use Trello. 
So for us, Trello was really powerful there because it it not only helped us in the classroom stay organized, and I mean, we really came to Trello through what you were reading, right? So it was your suggestion out of Royal Road's research that led us directly to it. And, and it kept us organized in a way we never were before. Exactly. Now I'm going to hit you with this idea. This is a Kanban system. This is a Japanese philosophy that was developed by Toyota in the 1940s. But basically, Trello is Kanban in a digital interactive online format. And when you see it in its analog format, it's very simple. And probably something you've done in a classroom. Anyone who's done any, you know, Barry Benedy type things or anything like that, where you're visualizing and working through creative process or anything else, it, putting stickies on the board is something everyone has done. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I know people who still work like this. This is, this is, uh, but this, but the essence is there. I need the difference is that if I need to see this board and it's Saturday night. I need to be in my school in order to see it. So we're going to try to present you with a digital example so that you can see how that will save you some um, some time. All right. So why tr Trello? There's basically four principles of Kanban, and this is how we're going to structure the rest of our presentation. We've got visualizing workflow, limiting the work in progress, focusing on flow and continuous improvement. So Trello can provide solutions for a variety of these collaborative issues and project management contexts. But an analog Kanban on board, like the one that we just showed you, cannot travel. It cannot hyperlink to research sources. It can't integrate with your digital timelines, whether you're using something like Google Calendar or any other communication tool like that. Communication has to happen physically at the board with all the people standing around it, right? And an analog can board Kanban board can't save your life when you're dropped into fully remote learning with little notice again and again and again. How many times did you move back and forth from remote to face to face? Three, four. Wow. So what kind of problems can Trello and project management best practices actually solve? Remember that we're going back here to um, some of the principles that industry is now concerned about. One of those is the no formal time for face-to-face -face meetings. How do you figure out time like that? You can't. And at the end of, in my case, context, a 76-minute um, minute period, or for my elementary cohort people, it, those 40-minute periods is super fast, right? So we're not going to be able to do that. And, and every time the bell rings and that's over, it interrupts the flow of our work progress. What about number three and four? How did you see that, Tim, coming together? So in terms of uh, Trello in the classroom, one of the things it does is it makes a publicly credible display of the work you're doing. So uh, if you've got those students who like to sit at the back and just fade away on their phones, uh, the Trello every day shows what they didn't do. And then other students are asking them, well, what are you doing? Because you're not doing anything on the thing we're all using. So um, it not only did it corral everybody into some shared expectations in a shared space, but it also motivated students who needed that. Um, and it also kept highly motivated students who would get lost in the work. They would be given one job and they would kind of overdo it and then spiral out of control. Um, it also allowed us to moderate things from that side. So if you saw a student sort of, you know, on fire, they're stuck in a in a in one ticket say uh one of the leads could come over and just say well, what's going on like why isn't this finished yet and then have a quick chat about it you don't need a meeting you don't need anything formal like that but it allows you to iterate really quickly so as they're developing trust with their their group mates and as they're developing pride and ownership in their own work one of the things i noticed you doing was sort of an informal show and tell. And I think that's where number five comes in here, right? Because as soon as you see where the standard is that someone's created, everyone else wants to reach that same height or or overachieve it, right? Is it competition that you're seeing there? What is that? It, it's not. Um, what ends up happening is, uh, first of all, in the case of a, we sometimes have some very strong digital arts students. So they'll do something and just share like a screen grab of it or something in their Trello. And people can quickly see the image and it, drummed up curiosity. Other people were thinking, how did you do this? So then what would happen is if we were in class together, that conversation would just happen naturally in class. And when we were remote, um, people would follow up on the tickets by bouncing over to one of our 
more appropriate communication mediums. We use Discord. And uh, they would just have live chats and screen share and just talk their way through it. Uh, people of a certain age do not like being on camera. I don't know that many people do. Um, but what's nice about Discord is it screen shares like a madman. So you can screen share and get right into what other people are doing. Just chat, you know, just voice. And uh, it takes a lot of the anxiety out too. So one of the things you just said was about tickets. And that brings us sort of to the number six and number seven spot because you must have had many, many moving pieces. Like, can you give us an idea of how many pieces would have gone into one piece of game development? Like, one, what would be one group be dealing with? So say you were working on uh, 3D models. So uh, you're making a game. You'd have 3D models based on uh, characters in the game. These would be quite complicated. They'd need to be rigged just so that they can animate and move around. Um, so we created a Trello board just for complex player animations. Um, and then anything that was sort of a character in the game would go in there. Um, there are other people working in that umbrella of digital arts where they were just making backgrounds. So these are more simple 3D models that we can quickly churn out. Um, so what it does is it allows you itemize by column what each group is going after, but then you can take those columns and link them together into a a working group. So we had a digital arts group. We had the coding group working on the actual game physics and like that in Unity. Um, so in the coding kids and the digital arts kids are usually quite distinct. They're quite different from each other, but they need to be complementary. So the other thing Trello did was bring everybody together on the same page and they could see what other work is going on. And it allowed our, our integration actually improved as a result of it, even when we were remote. Okay, I'm excited to get to some new, some actual examples so that this audience can see it. So let's talk about that. So we're going to visualize the workflow. Basically, we're labeling columns to either represent that the there's type of work or who is responsible. We're going to use these court cards to represent user stories. The idea of user stories is really key in Kanban. So one of the stories is on one of these um, sort of sticky notes, and they're moving from left to right as the work moves through its flow towards completion or revision and then completion. Okay, so color also is important here place the cards into the columns depending on their workflow status, and as work gets completed, move from left to right. So this is one of the ones from your actual space. And what we've got inside of the yellow um, box here is actually a screenshot from a Trello space. What are we looking at, Tim? So um, the students came up with two game concepts. One was Bloodshot Forest and the other one was Rapture. Um, in both cases, Trello lets you graphic things up and students like to author. So uh, you can see that they've made custom backgrounds or you know various things. The Rapture one has all these people being uh, taken up into the sky. If you see that and Bloodshot Forest was more of sort of a moody gothic uh, kind of game where you, you play in a sort of dark, creepy forest. So that they leaned into that vibe too. So you're creating a, a thematic space to work in as well. So you personally, you developed this project management space. That's you worked, created the workspace. You developed um, a template and then the students copied the template and then individualized it for their group. Am yeah, I right? In this case, I administered the board. So I created the boards, but then I left them to it. So I just called it Bloodshot Forest and then walked away. And one day I came back and there was a big red eye on it. <laughs> um, and they'd made categories. Um, in our case, our grade 12s teach the grade 11s, so they, they take lead roles in the projects. And so if somebody who's making 3D models for Bloodshot Forest could also work in Rapture. Um, and in some cases, the leads even cross over a little bit too. So there's always an opportunity to jump into each other's and see how they structured. Mm -hmm. And they did structure them differently, and there were repercussions for that. Interesting. Okay, so that maybe leads us to Kanban principles number two. Now, I know that this is hard, but this is part of the iteration piece. And it's at the same time, this is where the scope of any project really starts to shine if it's going to be able to make, make its deadlines or meet its limits. So limit work in progress, also known as WIP or WIP, means that anytime you exceed what you're actual cap capable of, you're going to result in a blockage. So when your group noticing notices a blockage, in other words, the work is not progressing at the pace that you had set out for it to do, then that means everybody can stop what they're doing and jump in and assist that. 
any sort of blockage interrupts the flow, others can't continue working. So the nature of this um, Kanban is that you will be able to visually see when blockages are happening. So here's an example of the board as it's now in process. What are we looking at now? So you can see that we've broken things up into different areas, specialties. Blender is 3D modeling, Unity is game coding, uh, but we also needed media effects. So we had uh, students making sounds, uh, students making graphics, um, um, icon logos, things like that. Um, and then the story details, I, I always try and bring this up and we've gotten better at this in recent years. But that idea of narrative and continuity really helps everyone stay on track. So we've put more energy into that recently. Um, but you can see what happens is whichever section you're in, you can complete your ticket. Um, the tickets come out in the section. So like say there's a blender ticket there and it's saying uh, we need a new uh, quest giving NPC model is one Sorry of the ones there. So someone would pick that up. They would make a model of that character. Um, I think he ended up being a goblin, this creepy little goblin. Um, and what would happen is they, they would work it through, get it ready. And as soon as they picked it up, it would go into progress. So people would see that that ticket's been picked. If it goes stale, like you were saying with whip there, people would say, well, you, you picked this up. You said you could do it in four days. It's two weeks later. What's going on? Um, so again, if we're face to face in class uh, and we've used Trello in there since uh, very quickly, people get support and people gather around and say, well, what are you stuck on? And then move them forward. So I can see up in the top left corner, for example, that the model for Blight, the main character was due May 28th. And this is not progressing at the same time. So that's an example of a blockage. And and that's a big one, because if the main character is missing, uh, there's a lot of integration that goes on with that model into the gameplay, obviously, because it's the main thing that you see all the time. So these are complicated animated models. So uh, the fact that that got delayed was a major issue. And when they realized it was a major issue, they pulled the stale ticket. They pulled the person who had taken it off it and gave them some other work to do that would let them develop the skills. They they basically bit off more than they could shoot. But sometimes when you realize, like, you know, when some, a student is initially trying this, they may think that that's something that's equal in terms of its scope to the environmental model, or let's say, for example, over in the completed area, potion model. But through this visualization, you can also break that task that's being hard to um, actually accomplish. You can break that into further cards, right? Yeah, and all of this data is being collected in real time in the background by um, by Trello. So if you need to see how many stale tickets you've got, if you need to see where your blockages are quickly, it allows you to do that. That's really cool. Do you want to talk about this one in contrast? So the GCID team B Trello board. I don't see anything, for example, that's stale. I see under the plan column because they've designed theirs more like the engineering process rather than the 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 uh, departments that go into a game. They've said, you know, initiate, plan, execute, work, and process, monitor, and control, and but they're using what, color here to differentiate between these things? Yeah, so in the case of uh, the, the the game board there, um, they're, they've broken it into um, focuses of study. Um, in this case, they've designed their entire process purely on Kanban principles, really. Mm -hmm. So this is designed around, uh, you know, initiating process uh, flow and then, you know, closing tickets and moving on. So this one is more Kanban designed, but there's a lot of freedom in this. You can pick by by a variety of different formats. It's cool that you see that because this is actually a screenshot from my post-secondary um, graduate studies in instructional design board. So we were actually, you know, imitating and learning about Trello by learning it, by mm -hmm. using it. So you can see we knew what we needed to do to come together. And we did this collaboratively with multiple time zones across Canada working at the same time. And we accomplished it. It was pretty cool. And when we were remote, we had a lot of students who were working 60 plus hours a week being heroes, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, so they just didn't have equitable access to the course. And this allowed us to see that. So we could have those difficult conversations and say, look, if you're helping feed your family right now, no problem. Like we can just, we that's can, right. We can, you can opt out. I'll give you your midterm mark. You're okay. Take a breath. 
look after yourself. So it it also allowed for sort of a transparency and um, for almost like, how can I put it? Like there was no risk averse behavior because people learned that they could be transparent in front of each other. Well, and if you couldn't handle it, you couldn't handle it. But we had other students who were working really long hours and then they would come home and do this to relax because they really like being there. <laughs> That's amazing. So me. so in that case, it was a lot like your different time zone. Mm -hmm, exactly. And so what we've done on this slide is we've put the left side. This is one of the software development um, tickets. And so you're inside the ticket. You can see we can uh, adjust the due date, the label, the description, and then we can build a checklist inside of it. And on the right-hand side, this is, again, the post-secondary version where we're working on a research project about instructional design models. Pretty cool. Kanban principle number three, flow. Do we actually ever achieve flow? It reminds me of, you know, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi's idea of happiness and how we want to actually like maximize our, our uninterrupted time so that the project work is actually getting done. So looking for blockages, tracking our time and tracking lead time to see how long the clients or whoever's on the receiving end is waiting for that delivery, right? Trying to also use metrics to see how long are things taking in order for them to get done. So when you look at this, and we're back to Bloodshot Forest again, what do you see? What is this timeline showing you? Is flow actually happening? Well, what we're seeing here is uh, there's a whole bunch of blocks for in progress. Um, what probably happened as a result of this, this is uh, we're in our final few weeks here, right? This is you can see the dates at the top. This is June. So uh, school is about to wrap up. Um, I'm setting deadlines at the end of that there. You can see where it says Goblin House on the right. Like we're getting really close to the end of the course there. Um, and what this group is doing is showing you that they're not piling on new work at this point. They're in a state where they've got a lot in process because they're trying to meet a deadline, but you can see the completion starting to go up. So there's a good example of flow there where you're not just seeing where blockages are, but you're seeing the entire project morph through the various phases. And this is in a towards the end of the project phase. And you can see that on the timeline. And at the same time, seeing those tickets come move through progress and to complete it, that's got to be really self-satisfying, right? Well, and there's no question about it. So somebody can't say like, yeah, I did my best. And then someone will go back and say, well, you picked up the ticket and I haven't done nothing since. Right. So that's not going to cut it. So it, the transparency just makes it makes it a functional working environment. You can't play politics here or anything else. You've got to work to what the expectations are. If the expectations were ever out of alignment, I would step in and adjust them because sometimes people do push too hard. Um, but And especially when we're in an emergency situation. And then, so from the teacher librarian or project manager point of view, you're actually to able to collect various types of data. So on the next couple of slides, Tim's picked these in order to be able to compare group data for you. Do you want to tell us what we're looking at, Tim? So here's a good example of uh, maybe things aren't going as well as we'd hoped. Um, what's happening here is um, at the beginning, well, towards the end of the first week of June there, uh, they're piling on a whole bunch of extra work because they hadn't done a lot of organization early on. And this group was really in trouble during the first lockdown. Uh, they basically, the, the person running the group had been just piled on with the hours um, and his, his mom lost her job. Mm. So he was basically paying the rent and everything. So, and of course he, you know, I mean, he, he's a really bright kid and he's really capable, but so he tried to shoulder all that himself. Um, so we got to this point where I said, you're opening more tickets and you can see what happened. They flatlined after that. So they threw all these tickets open. Nobody took them because what you should have seen after all those tickets opening up is the in progress go up after look and it didn't. So there's a lot of data in here you can see, and I didn't make this Trello made it for me. Um, you can just go to the dashboard and look at this stuff in real time. So let's look at the next group example. So again, this is over the same time period, the group with a very active and able to do it because they weren't paying their family's rent uh, group. Uh, you can see their completions are going up. Uh, their in progress aren't going down as much as you'd hoped, but you can see that they are. 
Um, and you can see they've still got some hanging tickets there, but they're not piling them on. So they're not adding a bunch of stuff at the end that they can't possibly finish. Uh, again, that would cause a blockage, right? So you, from a Kanban perspective here, this is a more healthy, there are still problems. These are high school students. But you can see in the data, and when I talked to them about it, they could see it in the data too. Like when we, we could have very clear discussions about what's going on and then usually identify where the problems are. What an excellent reflective or metacognitive process or exercise that must have been. More so than marks have ever been. Mm. So that leads us to Kanban principle number four. When you can be transparent about your own process and that of your group, you're likely to continually improve. You can plan how you're going to improve your current method. As you iterate, you can implement changes to test them. You can monitor these results as Tim showed you with the data cycles there. And if successful, you can implement on a wider scale. So I'm very curious to see how things like that change. Did you ever use this profile view in order to see individual students' activities? This is an example from my own workspace. I, I did, and, and the leads did. We very, very quickly got into the back end of Trello and started realizing all of the information that's in there. You can pull this data too and then just do like word searches or frequency of word searches. You take this and throw it into a sound cloud and all the people who are active have their names in giant letters on it. Um, and then, you know, the people who aren't doing anything don't appear on there. So the word cloud why. would actually emphasize. Yeah, and you right? can do this in Things a matter of effective. seconds and really lean into that digital environment you're in. You know, it's, it's not always a bad thing to be in this digital space. So... Trello wasn't everything. In fact, you did re refer to other resources. Let's talk a little bit about why you might not want to use Trello if this isn't right for your situation. So inside Trello, communication is brief at its best. It's not a discussion tool. We would suggest that if you want a discussion tool, then you need to either use or integrate Discord, for example. You use Discord. And uh Students can go in there and meme themselves to death and make themselves happy. But when we had people jump into Trello and just start putting, ha ha, I think this is a funny meme in tickets, it created chaos. We, we couldn't see what was happening in there and people were asked to stop. Um, Trello is not a discussion tool. It's not a ha ha tool. It's not a let's have a chat tool. It is a focused project completion tool in a very Kanban kind of way. And that same chattiness, I've experienced that if I am, and anybody else out there who's ever planned a super conference in Ontario will agree that Slack is that chatty, chatty place where we can link to things, but it's not the visual example of getting things done that Trello is. It's the communication tool. It's loose and informal, which is great too. You need that as well because it really is an escape valve. That's right. But it ain't Trello. Now, in my new job at TVO, we're using Microsoft Teams. In the past, I've also collaborated with things like Google Meet or Google Chat with remote learners, right? So all of those would be communication tools to integrate Trello with. So let's talk about integration. Yeah, so in my case, I emailed Trello and they gave me pro access. You, you can still use Trello and as long as you keep your boards efficient and to a minimum, you can just use it for free. Um, but in my case, I told them what was going on and because of all of the pandemic chaos, they just said, we would love to have you come on. We, we have no teachers doing this. So um, we got full access with the pro tools. You get some very advanced analytics. Uh, like to the point where you can see how long users and when they're coming on and uh, like it, it gives you everything. So and, and that's another for me opportunity to support if I need to, because if I see a kid's only coming on after 2 a.m. for 45 minutes, th there's obviously something going on there. So access to that is great. But I would say if you want Trello and you want to go full blast on it, just contact them. They're happy to help. So it's interesting that you also found that with the integration that the board um, Google Apps for Education accounts helped students to feel that they were both secure and private. That reassured people because of the integration. Yeah. And I mean, the fact that in Trello, though, like there's nothing personal you're putting on there again, because it's not a chatty, chatty, meme place. You're not giving away any personal information. It's not about that. So that was another thing we had to emphasize is a bit of a reculturing there, especially when we went remote for the mm -hmm. first time. But 
Trello as a workspace. And people saw that even better than they saw Google Apps for Education, which can sometimes get confusing. Yeah, I can see that. So there are more integrations that are available through Trello. Zapier is um, sort of a, an algorithm thing where you can get it to tweet or use social media or use any of the other integrations that you're looking for. There's over 3,000 apps that Tr Trello will actually integrate with. Um, so here are some of the ones that we considered. So in summary, we think that project management is a core skill. We think it is a literacy that needs to be brought to all students. And we would like to um, offer that this helps them prepare for a vital workplace expectation that exists everywhere now, except for in education, that we're just not teaching these skills. So that is the world that we would like to live in. We would like for all of our students to be project management Jedis. And we believe that you can be too. Maybe teacher librarians are actually positioned best to be the Jedi in this case. We've provided you lastly with some additional resources you might find helpful here. Project management is a profession. So because of the work Elena had been doing in our program, uh, we started digging into the Project Management Institute who have piles of free <laughs> material you can use. And this is all real world one developed, a lot of it around Kanban, but around other things too. They have Agile and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, and, and you know, the, that's something that we could bring into the classroom that would prepare students so they wouldn't get blindsided by this when they get out. Canada has its own project management um, organizations, and there are worldwide ones too. It's a huge um, group. Exactly. Community. I put this to list together because when I was first talking to my um, classmates about project management, they were reluctant to think of it as an essential skill. And I thought maybe it would be useful for teacher librarians to have um, a list of things. Here's, here's why you might give this a go. Um, one of those things is this murky nature of accountability. You join a group, you join a committee, and one person ends up doing all the work. Well, guess what? With Trello, you can actually evaluate who's doing what. Um, there's no dead weight group member anymore who's going to get passed based on your work and your knowledge. Consensus and truth are not the same thing, and that is a really big deal. So when you actually have data to support how things went over time, um, it was very transparent what the truth was. The nature of team development, why are you there and how does your fit into this team? It allows for an individualization of that group pathway. And I think that being transparent about what you'd like to accomplish together and what you find your own role is, is really um, invigorating to a collaborative process. And then finally, the transparency of the process. Transparency of the process is seldom the focus of assessment, but it should be. We see this transparency as a type of self-assessment. The project management is the evaluation of and as learning that we really desperately need. The metacognition, and that should be really self-evident, and that self-awareness is how you develop skills. It's really under everything, whether you're learning math or English or project management or, you know, C++. It doesn't matter what you're learning. That self-awareness of your place in your learning process is pedagogically vital. Absolutely. So finally, Tim, um, you know, with your new role, this just makes it even more obvious to you how important project management is. Could you talk about, about the resources that are on this slide? So as I was saying at the beginning, ICTC is the Information Communication Technology Council of Canada. Um, they've been around for 25 years. Uh, they mainly do research. Um, if you bounce over to ICTC on the internet, and the link's in the top right corner there, um, you'll see that the vast majority of what they do is nonpartisan arms reach research, um, but they work with a lot of federal uh, ministries to do this. So they're they're considered valuable in that way because they are one step removed. Um, in, in the case of educational outreach, this is something they've been doing more recently, but one of the things that have been really clearly identified is the fact that we are not delivering graduates with sufficient digital skills. And this isn't just current school systems, everyone's digital skills are remarkably poor. Um, if, I mean, there's a pile of research online that will show you that the number of people who can actually work 
um, iteratively and effectively in digital spaces is a fraction of the population. ICTC is hoping to fix that or at least take steps towards it by engaging with education and getting students on a pathway where they can see digital literacy opportunities and where they could take them. So uh, ICTC started Digital Youth as a part of uh, the DASH program, which is funded by the federal government. Um, and the idea of digital youth is to develop those pathways, develop that understanding, and recognize the skills that you're developing in this area because they are often ignored in school. Um, the one other piece to this puzzle, um, there are other programs too, like Cyber Titan that I'm a giant fan of, but um, the focus on IT or FIT program um, is designed to help secondary students develop these skills, recognize the skills as being important, because again, they are when they're often downplayed, um, and then connect them to post-secondary opportunities. Um, both of the links are on the page there, and um, both of them will take you to some really rich and usable resources. ICTC itself, probably through me, if you're in Eastern Canada, uh, will be overjoyed to hear from you and will move mountains to help. So you can tell that Tim and I are very passionate about this topic, and we've tried to just present a snippet of our experience and understanding of the, the scope of project management in schools. Um, but please reach out to us. The presentation, the slides, and our paper are here for you to peruse at your leisure, and we look forward to our deeper conversations at Treasure Mountain Canada. Thank you.